Hey, welcome to Relatable, Relationships Unfiltered. Self-sabotage is such a common experience in our relationships, often without us even realizing it's happening. And joining me today is Amy Fiedler, Certified Trauma Support Specialist. We're chatting about the different types of self-sabotaging behaviors and how becoming aware of them can really help us in making some much needed changes. This is Relatable, Relationships Unfiltered. Hey, Amy, welcome. Hey, Liz, how are you? I'm good. I appreciate you coming to hang out today and um, found you on Instagram. You have some great content, relationship-based and um, really about helping people navigate through a lot of the hard shit in our relationships. Yeah, I mean, same with you. You've got a lot of great stuff on there. I was watching your reels earlier today and I was laughing at some. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Got to keep it relatable. Yeah, yeah, people feel so alone. And uh, often when a client goes to start a story or after they tell a story, you know, it's like, oh my God, that was so stupid. I can't believe I, you know, I did that or I just told you that. And I'm like, we all do it. All the, uh, what we would call stupid or silly behaviors, the silly things we fight over. So common. So common. And I, and I think it's important that we relate to the people that are following us online or working with us to some degree, because I think it makes them feel safer to open up. Yeah. Yeah. And I relate much beyond some degree. I, I relate all too well to so many of those, uh, so many of those behaviors and the self-sabotaging behaviors that we're going to get into today. How do you describe self-sabotaging behaviors um, when you're talking to a client about that? How might you like gently bring that to someone's attention? I mean, I think it depends on what the behavior is, right? Like when I'm talking to somebody about self-sabotage, let's say they're, they're chosen flavor of self-sabotage is unspoken expectations, right? I'm going to point out to them that it's important to communicate. I'm not going to necessarily point out distinctly like, you know, you're doing this act of self-sabotage and go heavily into an explanation. I feel like it's better to point them in the direction they need to go than kind of redirect them backwards and say, you're doing this wrong, right? Sure. So give them the tool to move through it. But I think a lot of people don't realize they're doing these acts of self-sabotage because they're so normalized in their own way of being from their upbringing. Right. Yeah, they're they're what I would call their survival behaviors. So in our upbringing, you know, what we are faced with, the experiences, either the bad things that happen or the good things that don't. And all we want as humans is to feel loved and connected and accepted and esteemed and when we don't get those things, we had to figure out a way to survive that. We had to figure out a way to either kind of manipulate to make the thing happen or avoid and come to acceptance that it's not going to. And unfortunately, it did lead to survival in childhood, but and well, that's not the unfortunate part. That's good. But the unfortunate <laughs> part becomes that we then think because it was effective at one time, it's still going to be effective. And that's when it really starts. That's where the sabotage starts because we already have these beliefs of, um, you know, what to expect from others. Totally. It's like what once worked now is going to hinder you from yeah. the things that you need most or want most in your life. And then it ends up pushing the people that you want near you further away because, they're not mom, dad, or the caregiver, whoever you kind of like adapted that pattern to get your needs met through. I love that you use the word manipulate though, because I think a lot of people steer clear of using oh, the I word. I love that word. It's, oh, me it's too. the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, whenever I talk about people pleasing, I will explain that in a way where I say it's a manipulative behavior, but usually coming with good intent. Mm -hmm. And that I get a lot of pushback <laughs> for using from, from clients or from other professionals in our field? 
from usually people just like following me on the internet, you know, like the following on Instagram that I have is usually like, I'm not manipulative. And I'm like, well, as a former people pleaser myself, I was very manipulative. <laughs> yeah. I always laugh about that. And my other um, colleagues that have um, active communities online, will talk about that, that People will love a post if you talk about how fucked up their ex was and how like they're in the right and you don't deserve that. That's that's a million likes out the gate. If you say anything about accountability or, mm -hmm. um, hey, is there maybe a different perspective here? Um, not necessarily a million. I won't say none because I am grateful for um, for my community that there's so many self-aware individuals that are really doing the hard work. And I appreciate that. And I will also say that is not going to lead to as many likes when you talk about responsibility. No, we're on the same page there. I, I think it's the whole idea of like the victim marketing, you know, I, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's incredibly validating for them, but it's easy to get stuck in. Yeah. I find it incredibly disempowering. And I think it leads to these self-sabotaging behaviors that we're talking about. So when you are seeking out or only engaging in content that validates your perspective and that puts you in that victim position and your ex is the monster, which so rarely is actually the case. We often have our own perspectives of what happened and we're also both operating out of our survival behavior. So there usually isn't actually a bad guy, but because their survival behavior rubs up against ours, it feels really personal and we want that to be validated. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the validation key is key to moving through these patterns, but yeah. when you stop, when you stop there, I posted something the other day about like, what's keeping you stuck in your healing process and people's eyes were really opened when I said, you know, awareness is really only the first step. Yes. And, and that's usually that validating step. Like somebody posted something that was really relatable online and it connected to you and you were like, wow, I do that too. And then a lot of people just think that's enough. <laughs> that's right. Now I'm good. I can change. And it's like, no, no, yeah. no, actually you kind of have to feel everything and process it. And then you have to change the actual behavior. Like there's an action step in there that people don't want to take. Yeah. Cause it's hard. It's, it's really hard. <laughs> it's hard to change how we've been programmed. It's hard to change these behaviors that we believe keep us safe. And it's hard to admit that we're wrong because we want to believe that we have the best of intentions, which a lot of us do. Um, but it's really hard to return that favor to also believe that our partner is just doing the best they can as well. So I absolutely agree with you that the validation is crucial because that leads to safety. That leads to, yeah, you're right. That wasn't okay. And also what was your role in mm. this situation? Yeah. Yeah. What, what did you contribute to this? Because right. it takes two to tango here. And a lot of people don't want to take that, as you said earlier, that accountability. I mean, right. uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> the manipulation piece, though, I think is a very common self-sabotaging. And so that's actually something I have. Um, I always talk about that we all manipulate. Like, that's just the reality. It's just on what spectrum, you know, where on the spectrum that it falls. And also, what is the intention behind the manipulation? Um, and, and keeping in mind that a lot of times we're manipulating to get a need met, we're manipulating to feel safe. Um, and I personally have become much more aware in the last few months of how I, my manipulative tactics that I, I'm like, which is even harder a lot of times when we're in, when we do the work we do and we're like, no, we talk about this all day. Like I have, I have the highest level of self-awareness. And then <laughs> when your 16 year old son says, um, mom, that was really manipulative what you just said. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll take that humbling. Noted. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, I mean, that really caught, you know, was a good catalyst, a good motivation for me to step outside of that a little and kind of reflect on, okay, how is this coming up for me? 
you have to be open to that. And I think yeah. that's, you know, that's what we have going for us when we work it. Well, the most, most of us do when right. we work in this field is there's an openness and a willingness to, to reflect on ourselves and our patterns. But at the same time, when, you know, when somebody close to us reflects something back or says it to us, that's a yeah. tough pill to swallow. And when it's something along the lines of manipulation, you know, then you really have to look at yourself and get really honest. And I think a lot of people struggle with that self-honesty key uh, part too. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked about um, the self-sabotage being maybe the unspoken expectations or unspoken needs. How else do you see self-sabotage come up with your clients? I see the recreation of the the roller coaster ride that they once, you know, were very, I mean, that was me too. Yeah. For a very Let's talk long about time. That. Yeah. And and I think and and this I really would love to get into because I see a lot of people struggle with the idea that there's two parts to this healing process, right? When you are recreating that chaos, it's part nervous system, right? Your nervous system has adapted to that previous environment that was so used to the chaos. And so I know when I was removed from that environment and I was in a one bedroom apartment by myself at peace, I was on the edge of my seat like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Cause I'm like, I know it's coming. I know it's coming because my nervous system has long been in a different environment and is not used to this. So this is threatening to me. But yeah. the other piece is that cognitive piece that I think a lot of people these days think it's all one or all the other. And so what happens is they start doing regulation techniques and they don't actually change their mindset, right? And think mm. differently or perceive people or situations differently. And then they wonder why they still struggle. I'm curious your take on that as well. Absolutely. And I talk a lot about how healing has to be both internal and external. So we have to do the internal work of healing from the trauma and really taking those steps, which I, it's so important to me when I, to let people know, like healing from your trauma is unfortunately not talk therapy. Like talk therapy mm -hmm. does not lead to healing or reprocessing of trauma or uh, reprocessing beliefs around the trauma. Unfortunately, self-therapy is a, or um, talk therapy is a great approach to self-awareness and it's a great approach to like bringing it to light, but there are there actually has to be more to it. And so that is the trauma treatment portion of it, but then also learning the emotional regulation. Um, and I talk with my clients a lot about how those that happens simultaneously and they should, because as you're healing, you also have to learn how to regulate so we can get used to a regulated nervous system. But then the external component is also allowing for corrective experiences. So those safe people in our life that can actually give us a different template um, that not all people are chaotic and scary. Yeah. I think a lot of people, <laughs> when I say new experiences are healing and you have to be open to allowing those in, right. As you yeah. move in that direction, a lot of people say, well, where do I find those new experiences? Right. Where do yeah. I find the safe person? And I'm like, okay, now we're back at step one. <laughs> we have to, so true. We have, we have to learn how to discern, you know, who feels safe and who doesn't and, and who can respect us and what are the behaviors that we value versus what don't we and how can we advocate for ourselves? And then we can move into those newer environments and have those newer experiences that leave a better imprint. And then we feel safe. I mean, I've lived through it myself. So I know the the challenge. It took me years to get yeah. through it. And on the other side, and still to this day, I, things come up and I'm like, okay, yeah, <laughs> back at step one. <laughs> exactly. But that, and I love that you're saying that because even as professionals in this field, we do end up back at step one and there's nothing wrong with that. I talk a lot about how 
our growth is not about that we're watching. I mean, we see all the, you know, content about healing is not linear and all that. Yes, I get it. But beyond that, like the baseline though, increasing. So our baseline improving, that actually can be linear. So if we look at it, like we have our baseline and then we have this, um, you know, the curve that goes up and down. So thinking of a roller coaster, so up and down around that baseline, we, just because we had a setback, just because we went back to step one, doesn't mean our baseline dropped down. It just means that the curve along that baseline dropped down under it for a second, but it's, yeah. it's going to pop back up. And it's important that we keep that perspective of it because I know there's plenty of days where I'm like, what am I like? What am I doing? I, you know, I, I can't even figure out my own relationships. Like what the hell am I doing? And <laughs> it's, it's not true. I can figure them out. I just have bad days. You have bad days. You're human like the rest of us. And, right. and I think that's so, you know, it's so common that we think, oh my God, I have to have it all together because I do this for a living or, you know, or we've experienced people. I know for me, when I got started, I experienced people close to me saying, how dare you think you can help somebody when you've struggled so much yourself. And I'm like, that's exactly why I can help people the way I do, because I've been there. And, and that to this day is what people say to me is like, it makes me feel so much safer with you. It makes me trust you more because I know you've actually been through this and you're not just reading out of a textbook to me. And I'm like, I, I appreciate that because at least my pain is being put to good use. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I, yeah, I mean, the, what we've experienced enhances our ability to help others heal because we have had to go through the entire process and, and continue the process that is a, an ongoing journey. I think that imposter syndrome that we're talking about can become a self-sabotaging behavior for people in our field um, yeah. and, and for people in any field, but for sure, because if we think we're not good enough or that we, because we don't have it all together, then maybe we are not putting ourselves out there to help as many people as we can, or maybe we're getting in our heads as we're helping people. And that can be really detrimental as well. Totally detrimental that and like, and I feel like this can really kind of coincide with it is perfectionism. I right. feel like perfectionism can be an act of self-sabotage as well. And really can relate to the imposter syndrome. Like I have to have this all figured out and together. And quite frankly, that's not how I got started. I got started by sharing my mess with people and, and that's how it kind of built a following and a community that could really relate to me because I was just honest. I was just, I was just having a conversation with my mom earlier and saying, oh, my uncle is listening to my podcast lately and I don't have family members that listen to my my podcast so that's a little awkward because I talk a lot about things that I've gone through and mm -hmm. he's so uncomfortable with it and and but he's also you know in his 70s and it's it's kind of beyond him he doesn't know this version of me and I'm like it's not really for you but <laughs> you know, you can listen and you're going to get to know parts of me that you probably weren't aware existed because how would you know, right? Like just kind of like, how would anyone that follows us know what we've been through unless we've disclosed it to them? Yeah, absolutely. And then you have to wonder like, what is the motivation for him listening? Like what is, um, what is, I mean, have you asked? Because I guess I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> he, sh he shared. He said, he said, I'm trying to get to know you better. I said, that's not the route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe start can... with my favorite meal, my favorite color. <laughs> yeah. Call me, call me up, call your niece up and have a, a little chit chat. Maybe, maybe don't listen to the heavy stuff where I'm talking about ex-boyfriends and really traumatic relationships. I mean, yeah. you really dove deep real quick there. I'm not sure what you're gaining from it. <laughs> right. And I, yeah, that would be that. Does it get in your head when you know that? No, it doesn't. Shockingly. No, no. Okay. Shockingly. Sh yeah. I, I mean, because I think I, I know, and, and I've always kind of functioned this way. And really this is how I move past any level of like imposter syndrome. 
just be honest, Amy, is what I always tell myself before I post anything, before I write any caption, before I record any podcast, before I come on any podcast. Just be yourself. Just be honest. Tell the truth. And it really takes the pressure off me to have to pretend I'm something I'm not or say the things perfectly. I'm just being myself. So when I record my podcast, that's the most me I could be. So, you know, I mean, he's probably getting to know some layers that he would have never known if he just showed up to Christmas and left. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, that's a really powerful point, though. And that was big for me when I started um, putting myself out there as well, because the fear of are people going to think I'm less qualified because of my personal experiences, because of my mental health diagnoses, because of the toxic relationships I've been in. Um, and that was kind of my strategy as well was like, well, I'm just going to, if I'm the one to put it out there, no one can use it against me. So like, yes. and, and I say that I had a situation recently where um, somebody thought they were being very clever in saying, oh, well, wouldn't that be um, uncomfortable for you if people knew X, Y, and Z, which is way too fresh of a situation to get into, but in time I will. Um, and I, my response was like, if you knew anything about my brand, you would know that's exactly what it is, is that I am being my authentic self and I'm, you know, very open to telling people I don't have it figured out and it's okay to be human. And I think there's power in us being the one to say that because first of all, that creates so much safety for millions of people who are also afraid to be themselves um, just in their day-to-day -day lives, um, but that are constantly wondering like, what is wrong with me? And that's yeah. always been my shame message. Like that's always been my like shame tagline of like, what is wrong with me? And to be able to create community around it, like actually nothing. This is, this is human. I love that though. And I think it's so powerful and I, I obviously can relate wholeheartedly to it. If I, I always say to people on, on a smaller scale when they're like, well, what happens if somebody points out my flaw, right? Or my insecurity or calls me a bitch. And I go, can you be a bitch sometimes? Just like own it. Like nothing can hurt you that, that you take ownership of. Yeah. I know I, my tendencies, I know what I'm capable of. I know what I've done in the past. I know what I've learned to do now that is healthier and more supportive for me. I know where I could take it if I want to. So you're never going to catch me off guard and tell me I'm something and it's going to hurt me because I know who I am. And I think that's what a lot of people tend to struggle with is taking real full ownership over who they are and where they come from or what they've gone through because they've got to work through layers of shame. They've got to work through all of that stuff to get to the other side where you have that honesty and you have that I don't know, that, that safety with yourself. Yeah. Right. And th that, that being also a very common form of self-sabotage is not taking that ownership, not taking accountability, not being your authentic self. And when we think about even in terms of dating, that happens mm -hmm. so frequently, not just on the first date, not just on the second date, often through the honeymoon stage that we, we fear showing up as our authentic self because we think it won't be accepted. Again, going back to that being a form of manipulation, um, but also a form of self-sabotage because then inevitably, if you continue to date this person, they're going to see the sides of you that you've been trying to hide. <laughs> yeah. How does that usually end up going? <laughs> Well, I mean, okay, so I'm I'm seven months pregnant right now, right? And it's oh, all congratulations. Oh, thank you. It's a whole different ball game, right? Like because the hormones are high, everything. And my boyfriend is he's like, you're you're a different person in so many different ways, like really good, but also very emotional. And I was like, I've always been emotional. <laughs> I'm just hitting it until I was seven months pregnant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. But but you're you're right. When we start dating people, I, I know when I first started dating, it was after a six-year span of choosing to be single very intentionally, thinking, 
I had a lot to work through on my end. I was not ready to put myself out there and involve myself with someone again. And when I finally took that step to put myself out there, there were several dates. I mean, probably months of dates that I went on that I was just sifting and sorting through how to show up the oh. best way I could, right? And and really find my groove in that process because I had had not dated in so long. And when I finally got there, I realized just be yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> just be honest. Like and and I think, you know, alongside what you're saying is a lot of people tend to get into a dating experience and they drop into let's say people pleasing behavior where it's like i'm just going to acquiesce to and morph into whatever you want me to be which is something i always did which is total act of self sabotage because i'm abandoning and neglecting myself i'm trying to again manipulate you into liking me by being exactly what you want me to be right and eventually you're going to find out i'm a complete fraud and then right. I'm going to act like I'm caught off guard and be <laughs> devastated. But the truth is, is that it was my doing in the first place, right? Like I yeah. left myself to be something I thought you wanted or needed and I didn't stay connected to me. And I think, I think a lot of people don't realize they're even doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And that ties back into what you're saying about even recreating that roller coaster that, um, that all ties into it when you really think about it, because when you're able to people please and go with the flow um, for X amount of time, usually we can keep the peace, right? But that's mm -hmm. only sustainable for so long. And then inevitably something's going to happen. True colors come out. It often leads to the spike in the roller coaster. Um, but you have become so addicted to each other, like the this best version of each other. Because how often do you hear your clients say, like, I just want back what I had at the beginning of the relationship, right? I just want how, like, they used to show up for me and uh, do all these things at the beginning. And I just want that back. Like, I know they're capable because they did it. And it's like, okay. Or they were capable or, of doing it for just enough time to get you hooked. And then the roller coasters start. Or you were in a different place at that time. And so you perceived what they were doing as enough, right? Uh, and then yeah. perhaps you grew. Like I've had situations with clients like that where they started to really work on themselves and grow. And now they're looking back at this person going, he doesn't put in any effort in my direction. Like he he doesn't even call me. And I go, has he ever? <laughs> like, has he? And no, not really. Okay. Well, then you were in a different place. You saw right. it differently. You accepted different things. And now your expectations are different. Your standards are different, you know, yeah. but being attached to potential, as you're saying, is, you know, complete sabotage. Yeah. And the best of us do it quite frequently. <laughs> <laughs> it is a easy thing to get hooked on. Well, it's, and it's because it shows up in so many different ways, right? Like people, you know, even our parents or our caregivers can show us these like little glimmers of, of goodness exactly. or, or, you know, I, I have this conversation with my siblings a lot about our own parents. And one of my siblings is constantly attached to this idea that like, she can like change my parents and mm -hmm. my brother and myself are like, you'll get there. You're just going to have to accept they're not capable of certain things. Yeah. And, and she, and I see this with clients too, tries every which way to change herself, adjust how she's speaking to them to get the result or the response or the reaction, right? The behavior that she's wanting, which right. takes us back to the conversation about manipulation. Yeah. And the, the idea of like, well, if maybe I could have done something different, like maybe I could have loved them better. I could have loved them in the way they needed. If I, if I would have just shown up better, they could have shown up better for me. And, and first of all, sure. In some situations, yes. Like when you are showing up better for your partner, that invites them to show up better. But in the context that we're speaking of, that's not how it works. Like you can't love somebody enough to get them to love you back in the way that you need. 
But again, that ties into our relationship programming. It ties into what we learned as our survival behaviors. Um, I know that and that's big time was mine is that if I could just be good enough, if I was just could do enough chores without being asked, if I could get good enough grades, if I could be good enough at sports, you know, on and on, I could go with the list then maybe I could get, first of all, it, it got me safety, which is why it became such a, um, they at least left me alone when I was a good girl, right? So like, that was great. The second part was like, now maybe they can love me for it. Mm. Okay. Maybe we didn't get there, but now my inner child is then chasing that in romantic relationships of, you know, like I've learned these skills to stay safe and maybe to get me love. Now let's try it and see if it works. Um, but as we were talking about at the beginning, that often becomes so maladaptive and counterproductive. Um, it doesn't actually get those ne needs met at all. Yeah, but we all do that, right? I mean, it's that caregiver modeling or just how we adapted to that environment that we then you know, when I think back on some of the behaviors that I adapted growing up or or even the the environment that I grew up in and what was normalized, you know, like right. screaming and yelling was normalized. There was no conflict right. resolution. It was just scream, yell, berate, like to the point where you're seeing red hit, threaten the whole nine yards. And then the next day, there's a big smile in your face yeah. and they're like, like happened. Yeah. And you're like, can we talk about it? Oh, get over it. And you're like, okay, all right, that's weird. And 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 you're uncomfortable, but you adjust because you have to adjust, right? And they're all yeah. resistant. And then you take that. And when I think about taking that into any relationship I was in at that point, like it blows my mind now that I thought that was normal, right? And and then that's where that's the eyes I see all my clients through. Like I can't even. I can't even get upset with their struggle at any point or lose patience on my end at any point because I know it firsthand. And I think right. that's the benefit of that as well, is that when you've walked that path yourself, you're like, I know sometimes this takes years for people to, right. to get to that point. And, and had I had support, maybe I would have gotten there quicker personally, but I didn't. I had to kind of like go through a whole lot of stuff myself to get out on the other side. So hopefully I'm expediting it for, right. for them. Yeah. And so much empathy that, you know, when a client is sharing a story that um, we can see that, you know, we can really relate to like our heart just breaks in a different way, especially when they are feeling shame or embarrassment or you watch how their heart is breaking and you know firsthand what that feels like, you know, what that rejection feels like and what the chaos and what the fear. Um, and I, I agree that that does bring a different element to the healing process when your heart is breaking for them because your heart has been broken in the same way. Like you have felt that same trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, it brings a new element into that, that, uh, professional working relationship with them because right. they feel really seen and heard and understood. And you look like you have infinite patience, but <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. It's like, if only you knew, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do you help people to start to move out of the self-sabotage then? And, and, just going back to, so when I was asking how you kind of bring it to people's attention and um, your approach is that you you don't, you maybe point out what they could be doing instead. Um, and my approach is that I do. So I will, that's, I'm very well known with my clients. Like I am not a sugar coder. I'm going to call it for what it is. Um, and so I will say, um, usually maybe I'll lead them there. So maybe I'm not the one to point it out, but we do talk about it in terms of self-sabotage, because I think that that is important. After that is established, whatever approach that you use to get there, how do you start to move them out of those behaviors? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I just want to agree with you. I, I do call it what it is, but but more so in the efforts of like pointing them in the direction. So I'll, I'll 
tell them they're self-sabotaging, but it's more like, let's lead you away from this. Sure. You know, here's like, what you need to do. do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of, I think a lot of them want to talk about it for a very long time and that keeps them in it, you know? Like to um, justify it? Is that? Yeah, to justify it, to excuse it, to explain it away at a certain point. It's like, there, not that there's a set allotted time for us to sit there and and kind of like process and reflect as to how this is actually making you feel safe, but, but it's really not in the end, right? Yeah. But some people want to talk about it for the next five months and you're like, that's not going to be productive or supportive for you because at a certain point we need to now implement something new. Absolutely. So, so that's my goal ultimately is, is to not skip over the processing and, and, you know, that self-reflective element of why is this serving me or how did this once serve me and, Mm -hmm. and really bringing to their attention what am I, what's the payoff to this? Or am I doing this almost mindlessly? Because a lot of times that's what it is. It's this Mm -hmm. unconscious, this is just my normal behavior. And this is how I interact in this environment, or this is how I cope with this thing. When you slow them down and you bring it to their attention and you're like, are you getting what you're actually wanting from doing this? They're always like, no. (laughs) <laughs> like, okay. And, and I've listened to people say, you say it so simplistically that it makes it digestible for me. And, and then it seems like common sense. Whereas before it seems like this almost like foreign entity when you point yeah. it out to them and they're, they're just doing it, uh, to move them out of it though. Like, how do we get out of the, the, the sabotaging behavior My first step is always, I mean, that component of what are you wanting, Mm -hmm. right? Like what, what is, what is the behavior that you value in others that maybe you're not aligned with doing yourself? Cause that tends to be a common theme I see is that their expectation of someone else is not actually how they're showing up for that person. Mm -hmm. And so they're pushing them away or they're doing their act of sabotage to get a need met, but demanding and expecting someone else to give them something different. So I, I bring them back to what do you value? What are you wanting? What is your need? What is your want? Let's identify that. And then let's align our behavior with it. And then mm-hmm. that usually sparks a conversation as to what does that look like for you, which they usually hate. They're like, could you just give me yeah, just tell me the answer? And I go, well, what it looks like for me is different for what it, from what it, what it looks like for you. You know, the way I want to be loved, the way I want to be supportive, the way I want to have affection, you know, communication, whatever it is. It's going to be distinctly unique to me and my needs. You need to get in touch with your own. And that's then a process in and of itself. For sure, which usually involves providing lots of examples and um, different ideas around it. Because for a lot of us who were raised to believe that having needs makes us needy and an inconvenience and a burden and all the things we don't want to feel like, uh, we often don't stop to put thought into our needs and let alone how to appropriately express that. And so you're absolutely right. And what I also tell my clients is that often becomes like a weeding out process because so a client might say, they're just not meeting my need. They're not meeting my need. I don't even know if I should be with them. Maybe I should just leave. And and then we talk about the self-sabotaging behavior. So how are you trying to get your needs met? Okay maybe not such effective approaches at this point. So let's talk through that. What can we modify? We go through all that process. And then the discussion is, if you are then showing up in a healthy, appropriate way, asking for a need to be met, and it's still not being met, that gives you all the clarity you need on how to move forward with the relationship. Um, But if you are still engaging in those inner child behaviors and you're still throwing a tantrum and being just wildly inappropriate when you don't get what you need, 
if your partner is condoning that or enabling that or or kind of giving into that, that's probably not the partner at the end of the day you're going to want anyway when you get through your healing process because then that chaos is just as normal to them if, you know, if they are participating in that. Yeah, totally. Do you find that they're really resistant at the point where you point out to them, you know, this is this is what you're wanting and this is what you're needing, but this is what you're doing or this is what you're allowing yourself or, or tolerating from another person? Because I find with my clients, there's a lot of resistance kind of going back to the being attached to potential. Mm -hmm. They are very resistant to either A, not wanting to adjust their approach, even though you can map it out for them very clearly, right? Or they're very resistant to recognizing and accepting this person is not actually aligned with what I want or what I value. And in other words, falling into kind of the unhealthy bucket and I should probably go elsewhere, right? And do you find that there's a lot of resistance there? Absolutely, because that is the programming. That is what is so deeply ingrained in us to accept these behaviors that we can intellectualize as harmful and inappropriate and toxic and painful. And our emotional side, our our somatic side says, but that's what I know. That's what's familiar. That's That's what creates dopamine for me. That's what creates excitement for me. And so toggling between the dissonance of the, the, um, you know, that logical and the emotional brain to say, okay, I have to make a really hard choice about what's best for me, not what's familiar for me. And absolutely it, that is a process because, you know, when we're talking about being really addicted to the roller coaster, to the, the chaos, the, it truly is an addiction. And yeah. so we crave the ups and downs. We crave the highs and lows. And we are also part of our programming is that we receive a message um, that chaos equates to love. So the yeah. people who love us are chaotic. The people who love us neglect us. They avoid us. They, you know, all of these things. Um, and so that is not something that happens overnight to start to decouple chaos and love. And, and you and I know that all too well, right? That's, that was our programming. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, I know for me, there were components as I started to move out of it of how can I maintain, like with my parents, for instance, how can I maintain a relationship when the only way I can connect with them is through chaos? Like yeah. the only connection to them, the only way I can get on the phone and actually have a conversation where they engage is if we're talking about other people or we're gossiping, right? Or there's a problem and it's very heightened and everybody's freaking out. And I had to really redefine those relationships. And I, I find that there's a lot of that that needs to take place as well, not just redefining what we want in a relationship, or if we're changing a relationship that's going to stay in our life, but also redefining some of those words, right? Like, what does love actually look like? Or what does caring about me actually look like? Because it doesn't necessarily look like the chaos that I grew up with. Absolutely. I love that you're saying that. That's my, I have a post that says real love is not, and then I list multiple things that it is not. And that's where that comes from because, um, yeah, that is when we are programmed to believe that, that the people who care about us the most are going to behave in these ways, then we allow that to continue to happen. And, and I love that you're saying that because it's redefining not only those relationships, redefining our boundaries and our expectations yeah. and what we're willing to tolerate. And, um, for some people, it is finding a new norm with their parents. And for others, myself, it's that I won't interact with my parents because mm -hmm. I I won't continue to be um, have that abuse normalized and perpetuated. And yeah. so that those are decisions we have to make. And that that is a really good um, even comparison to in a romantic relationship. Often it comes to that decision, the acceptance or change like. We can accept these components or we can decide to move out of it. 
Um, but something's got to give. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, for, for the people that struggle sometimes with making those decisions, you have to reinforce that there's no one right way, you know, as you just pointed out, like some of us want those relations and it's an individual decision. And some of us opt out or some of us really have no choice because the behavior is just so, you know, inappropriate or disrespectful or harmful to us that we have no other option but to remove ourselves completely. But there is always a choice and that is an individual choice. And that's where I tend to emphasize to people the use of the word and in this healing process. You know, you can care about them and you cannot tolerate that behavior and, you know, and, 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 and (laughs) in so so many other ways. Yeah. So true. The and is in our healing. The and is in our relationships. The and has to exist. Totally. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Where can people find you? What's your socials and website and everything like that? Totally. I'm always on Instagram. You can find me at Amy, the life coach on Instagram and most other uh, social media platforms. I'm at Amy, the life coach, or you can check out my website, amyfiedler.com. Well, thank, thank you again, Amy. I really appreciate everything you've provided today. I appreciate your vulnerability and I just, all of your helpful tips so go check her out on Instagram. If you're not already following her, just really um, easy to connect to content. So I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Liz. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks again, Amy, for all your insights on how to stop these self-sabotaging tendencies. And thank you all for hanging out on Relatable Relationships Unfiltered. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, sign up for my newsletter, and find me on Instagram at Dr. Elizabeth Bedrick. This is Relatable Relationships Unfiltered.